Hello, it's Scott Manley here with part 12 of Kerbal Spaceships Are Serious Business, and we are rolling out the Crater Maker next to the launch pad. Yes, this is, as imagined, it's going to make a crater. It's not going to make a crater on Kerbin, because that's quite easy. No, we're going to try and make another crater on the moon. This time we have a vastly more complicated guidance system, but of course, the first thing we need to do is put it onto an orbit, which is coplanar with the moon, which is actually kind of hard. What's most important is I need to make sure that the launch site, Kuru, of course, in, uh, I think it's Ecuador or something, I don't know, it's one of those South American places, need to make sure that that is underneath the orbital plane of the moon, which is actually kind of hard to do from the tracking station because the tracking, because there's no cues here. However, if I switch to the launch pad, then it's entirely likely that some of the fuel will boil off or something like that. Look, we're running it forwards, we're just waiting for it to appear. And uh, I also want to do it during the daytime. I want a daytime launch here, so get it as close to the middle as I think is prudent. Uh, yeah, I don't know, completely eyeballing this. Just gonna let it maybe move a little more. Just be careful, I don't want to overshoot it there. I think that's, that's about as close as we're gonna get. So we are gonna go with that. This is our launch window. I have no idea how long it is. I have no idea what the weather restrictions are. Uh, but I do know that we have a rocket and we're going to launch it upwards. And really, that's all that matters is you know that you have a rocket, you're sending it somewhere, and it's fully capable of doing whatever it needs to do. Okay, so this is the launch vehicle here. We have a 2.7 meter four-way RD-107 engine on the core, burning liquid kerosene and liquid oxygen. Uh, obviously, the liquid kerosene would be very silly. Uh, yeah, uh, it's got that. It's got the 0107 uh, second stage, and then it's got a next-gen AJ-10 on the upper stage, I believe, to actually take us to the moon. And finally, it has a tiny little engine on the final stage. Now, of course, this is an uncrewed mission, and after the previous episode, I should point out when I was talking about manned spaceflight, and I said, well, you know, Kerbals, female Kerbals, they're not all men. Someone was like, wait a second, the man in manned spaceflight is a reference to humans. And, well, that is kind of a logical notion, but these are Kerbals. A very wise individual on the internet responded by saying, well, perhaps it needs to be bald flight, right? Because Kerbal, right? So, and that actually works really well. So you'd have bald flight. Uh, if you were launching a rocket with crew on board, that would be a balls up. If you were flying a plane with a crew in it and you flew it into a wall at full throttle, that would be literally going balls to the wall, right? Because, you know, the origin of the phrase balls to the wall is in aircraft, right? All the throttle levers in the middle had little, like, balls on the top and you would push them all the way forwards to the firewall. And, yeah, of course, if you were going the other direction, if you were going into the oceans, if you were going into the depths, going deep, then that is, the technical term, is going balls submersible. Because, of course, this is a PG-rated show, right? Oh yes, here I am trying to get my cheap laughs here, right? No, uh, astronauts actually would use the term balls quite a lot. That would be where you had a sequence of zeros, so you might refer to, like, guidance information with a lot of zeros as balls, for example. All balls, balls in the court, or whatever. Um, and the B-52, which carried the X-15 on a bunch of flights, was called Balls 8, because its registration number was 00008. So, Balls 8, right? Anyway, uh, as you can see, this is pretty much a standard launch here, and nothing interesting going on other than what I'm saying here. But it is worth talking about the engine here. So, this is another AJ-10 derivative. If you know the AJ-10s, of course, they are pretty much the standard uh, rocket that appears throughout US space history. This is this kind of second generation version that Realistic Progression gives us, and it has the ability to restart. It has three ignitions remaining at this time, so we shall exploit that. 
So we're going to burn out in just a minute and then we will cruise around to our correct uh, position for a burn to the moon. We are successfully in orbit. We're in a slightly eccentric orbit, but actually, although there's a 100 kilometer difference in altitudes, our actual eccentricity is still 0 0.011. So it's like less, it's 1.1% eccentricity because the planet is actually quite big. So what we need to do, of course, is fire our engine. We should probably fire it near the ascending node because that means the descending node on the other side is guaranteed to pass through the orbit that we're trying to get to. So let's start here. Just drag that out to get ourselves an encounter ever so carefully. And we've got ourselves a trip to the moon. So yeah, cut out a whole bit of faffing around there, but we do finally get ourselves into a position to send ourselves to the moon and we get our engine set up. Now, because this has been floating around in orbit, it's entirely likely that the fuel is now floating around inside that tank and there is potentially a void which could end up getting sucked into the engine and then would cause the engine to shut down hard start or possibly explode. So we're going to use the reaction control system to provide a little forward thrust and by doing so make sure the fuel settles towards one end of the tank and the engine fires. Beautiful! Now that engine is going to carry us onwards and upwards, upwards towards the moon. Uh, it's not going to get us all the way there but that's fine because we have a second stage or we have a final stage which is actually split into two parts. And that should give us something like 1.5 kilometer per second of delta V. That final stage is actually two probes incidentally. You can see that there is a separator in the middle. So we're going to go for both an orbit and a collision. We're essentially doing Luna 2, which uh, was the first object to smash into the moon. And we're doing Luna 10, which was the first man-made object to orbit the moon. I think it did it in uh, 1965. It was certainly before the Apollo sent any... Uh, any manned missions there. So anyway, this is the final stage of the rocket. It has two probe cores on it. Each allow a control or avionics limit of 200 kilograms. So you add those together and you get a 400 kilogram satellite. We've packed it with all the instrumentation we need, enough fuel. We have an, a separate independent antennas for each half. The front part is a impact system and it has its own little propulsion, it has a little solid rocket booster to push it off of there. The rest of the spacecraft has a fuel tank, but because the entire spacecraft is more than 400 kilograms, I cannot split the spacecraft, I cannot perform that separation until I have burnt through enough fuel that the mass of the remaining spacecraft is less than 200 kilograms. It doesn't look like I'm going to have a problem, but some, something that uh, I have to be careful of, I guess, and it, it does actually help you save weight because it means, or it helps you save time because you can do this with a much lower tech spacecraft than you would otherwise have. Anyway, the crater maker next is gonna hit the moon. That's brilliant. So I'm gonna make a small adjustment to my course and uh, I'm just gonna do it live, so firing the engine just a touch Hoping, yeah, there we go. So we've got a Mooner encounter now. All I needed to do was fire the engine and shut off. The reason I'm firing and stopping it immediately is because time lag now. Light speed delay is actually getting important at this distance from the Earth. Even at this distance, things are going to start to get harder and it's going to get even worse as I get towards the Moon. From this vantage point, we can watch the Moon coming towards us, or us coming towards the Moon. It's always so hard to tell when relativity is involved. But more importantly, we're getting more science. And it's quite important for us to clear up as much science as, as we can find around the Moon. Because as you know, science in the wrong hands can be very dangerous. So it's our duty to take as much science as we can and make it unavailable. Now, what I'm trying to do is plot uh, an impact course for the impactor stage. If you look down, you see that the delta V for the final stage of this rocket is 95 meters per second. So what I want to do is set up a maneuver node with exactly 95 meters per second of delta V and we'll know where it's going to land. And ideally, I'd like it to land somewhere where it can see the planet Earth. 
so that it can continue to communicate right up to its ultimate demise. That is actually a feature I'd really like in MechJet, by the way, the ability to say, I need to get from here to here, and I need to use exactly this amount of Delta V in one burn, right? So basically, I have a solid rocket booster, plot me a course that uses this solid rocket booster. Okay, we're ready to fire, and off it goes in but a fraction of a second. It is moving, oh, apparently it's moving a little faster than it was supposed to. That's fine, as long as it didn't miss the moon. I mean, there we go, it's going to hit on the day side, that's great. Okay, we are flying apart at 100 meters per second or so. Everything's looking good, 12 hours to impact. Uh, this thing is in the wrong place. And, uh, yeah, we're getting more science, clearing out the science, making uh, the moon the safer place. But actually, I've just realized I should be making a course correction here. Yeah, let's just do this manually. Just fire the engine to bring those things in. I have to be careful because I have about a one and a quarter second lag here. And I'm doing this manually rather than saying programming, say programming the computer to do it. 50 kilometers. 30. Excellent. That's pretty good. That'll take us down near the surface. And now we can watch this thing happening. Look at that. One will survive, one will die. One will die in a blaze of glory. You know, the, the Russian impactors, incidentally, they had, instead of having a flag, they had these, like, steel balls that were hollow with, like, grooves cut in them. The idea would be that they would hit the ground and then shatter into these little metal pieces which would all basically say Russia 1959 or whatever year it was that they actually put Luna 2 on the surface. So, you know, even when they were impacting, they still thought about how to have, you know, national symbols and everything on there. There we go, not bad. We can see the Earth all the way down. The Earth is receiving, the Earth is fascinated to know everybody is sitting on the edges of their seats Wondering what this thing will see. Will it wake some sort of old god in the moon? I'm sure there's a small cult out there that's protesting right outside mission control saying, please don't smash things into the moon. We would like the phoenix egg not to be woken up. Nope, nothing is waking up. It is just a big chunk of rock in space. But it's a fascinating chunk regardless. Okay, having spent all our time working on the, the impactor, now it's time to put this thing into orbit. So, of course, set up a standard burn, and you'll notice that during that, I, my comms started out green, and now they are red. So, in trying to get the orbit set up right, I completely missed my window for setting this up as a maneuver. So, this thing... It's going to have to wait until it can see Earth again before it can fire its engines. And it pretty much has no choice because it can't exactly wait for another pass. Still, it can uh, remember what it's seeing right now. In fact, it can remember some of the data that it's potentially getting from the science. More gravity recorded accurate measurements of gravitational forces in these conditions. And I have to say, the moon does have one of the more interesting gravity fields. There's, it's a, a relatively lumpy gravity field compared to the Earth. I mean, much lumpier, which causes most objects in orbit of the moon to have their orbits become unstable. There's a couple of frozen inclinations or frozen latitudes at which you can safely orbit the moon without your orbit changing too much. But uh, yeah, most of the time an object orbiting the moon will be lost eventually. So wait for this, wait for the earth rise. Wait, I see you. You're just hiding over that horizon there. Thank you. Now, without wasting a minute, I have to turn this thing around and again, one and a quarter second lag. I'm doing this manually because, um, I don't know, because I thought it would be fun to fly a spacecraft with one and a quarter second worth of lag. You know what will be fun? Trying to land one of these things with one and a quarter second worth of lag. Or say, control a TV camera as you're trying to match or watch a launch of a lunar module. The Russians actually had a Lunokhod 1 and 2 on the moon, and they operated those for ages with a one and a half second delay. It's not like curiosity or opportunity to actually have some smart software on board that can do certain things somewhat autonomously. 
But anyway, we are coming up to getting this thing into orbit, which is uh, the equivalent of Luna 10. Now, Luna 10, if you know, it got into orbit around the moon in the mid-60s, so I guess by, you know, that standard, we're already hitting milestones 20 years plus after the start date. Funny story about Luna 10 was that after it was going to get into orbit, it was supposed to play back uh, like a communist anthem back to Russia and, you know, everyone would stand and, you know, appreciate the great moment, the glory of the state and all that. Uh, they tested it and then when they were testing it a second time the morning of the event, they noticed that it was missing a note. So the guys in Mission Control, they basically played the tape to the, the supposedly live event. Uh, I'm not sure if the, you know, the leadership actually knew about this, but it is kind of interesting. There's a video of these guys all being very proud of their achievement and not realizing they're actually listening to a recording from Mission Control. Anyway, now with this in orbit around the moon, we've completed two new contracts. We have a permanent uh, science lab orbiting the moon, and we will continue to use this in future episodes. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.